This is video two for our microfungi lecture. So here it says the phylogeny of kingdom fungi, fungi is always changing. So here is a phylogenetic tree, this branching tree diagram that illustrates a hypothesis for how these organisms are related. That's what a phylogeny is, this evolutionary history of organisms. And it's always a hypothesis, and so it's always changing when there's new evidence. Fungi have been poorly studied for a very long time, so the fungal phylogeny is changing maybe more rapidly than in other groups. So all of these groups are considered within kingdom fungi. Microsporidia, I think, are sometimes out of it, sometimes in it. They're sort of um, this ancestral group, potentially within kingdom fungi, potentially not. They're on the border, sort of like sponges within animals. They're still in, but also sort of serve as an out group. So here we have the major lineages that we'll cover in this class. I'm going to draw a simplified version of this phylogeny that you'll draw along with me. We won't have all of these multiple branches leading to one group, um, but we'll have them as dotted lines to indicate that they are not a monophyletic group. They don't all diverge from the same shared common ancestor. So here you can see there are two lineages of, of Chytridiomycota, um, one that is shared with all of the rest of these groups, their common ancestor, and another one of those lineages that's um, a sister group with Microsporidia. And that's just in this particular phylogeny, which is not particularly recent, but it's a less complex diagram than many of the other ones, so I, I chose this. So here is our simplified phylogeny. Notice that Chytridiomycota and Zygomycota are dotted lines. That is because they are not monophyletic. They have multiple lineages that we have classified in that group, but they're not a true group. So they're also in quotation marks because they don't really exist anymore. There's still a Chytridio, I think there's Chytridiomycetes, there might be a Chytridiomycota, but there's also the Plasteocladiomycota and the Neocalagastigomycota. And all of those used to be considered Chytridiomycota, but we found out they're not as closely related as we thought, and they share common ancestors with some other lineages of fungi. So they've been broken up. That's why it's a broken line, because they've been broken up. But it still makes the most sense to refer to them by these topical names, because they share all of these characteristics, which is why they're originally placed together. So know that those two are not real groups anymore, but it's still useful terminology, and you'll see it in the book, um, and you'll see it here in the slides. And in most things that you look at, they'll still have zygomycota and chytridiomycota, but they're not real groups anymore. Okay, here at the base of the phylogeny, pointed at in this purple uh, font, I would move my mouse, but then it'll bring up that little menu that covers the slide. So there are two ancestral traits. These are traits that are present in all of kingdom fungi, but aren't necessarily... Um, derived within kingdom fungi, so they're ancestral traits. These we can use to classify the whole group, but not differentiate within the group. So, early, early fungi and the ancestors of fungi were aquatic, and they had zoospores, which zoo refers to like alive and moving, um, so that term zoospore just means a spore that has flagella, it swims around. So they were aquatic, and they had swimming spores, they're also cenocytic. That is a term that is new for you, I imagine. So cenocytic means that it's not divided into different cellular components. It's all one connected tube for fungi. Other organisms can be cenocytic, and that just means they, they don't have these um, wall divisions for their cells. But for fungi, that means there's no cross walls within their hypofilament. It's one big connected tube. The whole mycelium for a cenocytic fungus is all connected. And that could present problems, right? What if you damage a certain part of that mycelium? Does all of your cytoplasm then leak out through that damage? Um, how can we better regulate that? Which is sort of the evolutionary progress of fungi. So cenocytic, I think of that as cenocepta, ceno cross walls. We'll talk about septa as well once we get to the higher fungi. Okay, so the first group we'll look at are the chytridiomycota, or what I might refer to as chytridiomycetes or chytrids. This is what they look like, some of them have this large sort of globose um, 
thallus, which is a, an undifferentiated body, where they'll make their spores, so that would be their sporangium, and then they have all of these um, root-like structures called rhizoids. So chytridiomycota, um, let me move myself here, are aquatic, and they have swimming spores. So this is the only group that we'll look at that has flagella still. All of the rest of the groups will have lost flagella. So aquatic with swimming spores. Many are plant uh, parasites, and those are some of the ones that have managed to move into terrestrial environments, but then they'll live on and in plants. And some are animal uh, parasites. So the chytrid that you probably, if you've heard of a chytrid, it would probably be um, Betrachochytrium dendrobatidis, and that is commonly called BD. Um, it is a parasite of amphibians, and in particular frogs. It gets into their skin. Um, I'll talk about it on a future slide, but it causes death in most frog species. Um, some are just carriers of it, like bullfrogs, which is part of what makes bullfrogs even worse as invaders. Um, but it's global. It's everywhere. Um, and being sort of enhanced potentially by climate change and the, the warming and stresses and pollution and everything else that frogs face, um, they now have this additional parasite. However, not all chytrids are parasitic. Some are mutualists. Um, so inside the guts, uh, particularly the rumen of ruminants, um, animals that are ungulates with hooves that have this kind of pre-stomach where they're grazers, they're eating all this grass that they can't actually digest. So it first goes into this rumen compartment that's full of bacteria and um, a chytrid called neocalamastix can live in there. Um, a community of organisms who function without oxygen. It's an anaerobic environment and it's kind of aquatic, right? And they break down the cellulose within the plant cell walls. And then when you break up cellulose, which the cows and deer can't do, but when the fungi and bacteria do, it breaks it up into a series of glucose molecules. And those are accessible for the cow or the deer. So what they get out of that rumen is this highly sugar-rich material that then goes into their stomach and they can digest. So here are some images of um, BD. These are, I think, the sporulating structures. And then here we have a frog that's infected. You can see its skin is kind of sloughing off. Um, they'll get these pustules on their skin where the spores are reproduced. Um, here you can see one of those spores in its single whiplash flagellum. Frogs that have it tend to get this like splayed legs kind of sitting posture. It's one of the ways you can tell that they have it. Um, but this is um, maybe one of the <laughs> saddest things about fungi is that they're pretty good parasites because they're, they're hard to um, get rid of because they're so similar to us. And this is where Chytridiomycota is on this phylogeny. So note that it has these different lineages that are all classified within this umbrella of chytrids. Also, it's spelled wrong on here. Um, so maybe this is, I don't know, from England or something, where sometimes they spell stuff differently. Okay, so Zygomycota. This is another group that's not a real group anymore. But they all make this cool zygospore. This huge warty structure, you can kind of see one here, um, that has many nuclei inside it. This is where those nuclei fuse together, and then meiosis happens, and then they're haploid again. So this structure occurs in all these groups, and so they are classified as the zygomycota that make these zygospores, but they're not all directly related to each other. So they're often called sugar fungi because they're common causes of rot on fruit and vegetables. So when you have um, bread that gets a mold on it, you've got um, strawberries or tomatoes that get moldy, often those molds are zygomycetes. They might also be ascomycetes. So um, you have to look at them um, under the microscope to really be able to tell. But there's some classic ones that uh, you can sort of figure out. This group is also called the pin molds. It's unlike the ascomycetes who make these crazy kind of fluffy molds, they make this um, sporangiophore, or yeah, I guess it's still a sporangiophore, and then a globosporangium at the top where all the spores are inside, so it looks like a little push pin. So that's another way that you can tell, sort of visually, just assessing what kind.
kind of fungus you have. For this week's lab, you need fungal samples, so molds are a great option. So if you have anything that's going bad, save it and um, use it for this week's lab. You can try to figure out whether it's a zygomycete or an ascomycete. There are some important insect and human pathogens in this group. Um, one of the few fungal diseases for humans that you'll hear about is um, this mucormycosis, where people with um, already weak immune systems who um, are, are immunocompromised for some reason, um, if they inhale some of the spores of this particular fungus, it can grow inside their nasal cavity and um, cause like gangrene of the face. It's pretty terrible. Um, they are a very diverse group with complex history, and it's since been split into several lineages. One of these major lineages are um, insect and arthropod parasites. Um, the other major lineage is, you know, one that you'd find commonly rotting your fruits and growing on poop. Um, these like more of the sugar fungi. And here they are. This one represents two. I think it might even be three. So a trait or traits that have happened here are we have lost flagella and we have gained zygospores. And notice that this is on the main line because we actually sort of have a zygospore like structure in the glomeromycota and then we lose it after that. So these multiple lineages that were all united for having this weird, crazy structure, it's thought that this evolved within all of fungi and then was potentially lost. So here are some examples. This one I find all the time. I have a yard with a lot of grass and um, I think it's in like early sort of springtime. We have a lot of dung flies too because there's a lot of pasture land around us. Um, we have dogs that poop or dog now, sad. Um, and Flies will get infected by one of these zygomycetes, entomophthora, which means uh, insect destroyer. And then it infects their body. It causes them to have this sort of weird behavior where they go latch on to a piece of grass or a leaf and then just sit there. And then the fungus grows out of them in these kind of puffy white bands um, in between sort of, uh, I'm terrible with insect biology, animal biology in general. Uh, sort of plates of their exoskeleton, I guess. And eventually, it'll burst open. So you'll see maybe the front half of a fly after this has occurred, and you can kind of keep track of it over a couple days. They'll also sometimes show up on a window and cause this little halo of um, spores to kind of appear on the window after they explode. They're more common than you'd think. So this is one potential thing you could look at for lab if you can find it. I'm not sure it's quite the time of year yet. Bread molds are often um, like rhizopus, which they call it rhizopus, means root foot, because they make these little rhizoid-like structures at the base. So this is common on tomatoes, strawberries, and bread. Here it is on a tomato. And see that pin-like structure, where we have this long, thin hypofilament, that's sporangiophore, that holds up the sporangium. That's this globose thing on the top. It doesn't look very powdery. So pin molds belong to the zygomycetes. Here are some more pin molds. These get extremely tall. These would, might be, you know, six inches tall. And they have this really distinct sporangium at the top. It starts out yellow because it's full of beta carotene. It is navigating towards sunlight, growing up out of poop. At the base of this, you would find some poop. This is phycomyces. It was named that. Phyco means algae. So it's called the algae fungus. This was still, it's one of the first um, fungi that was sort of described. Um, so this was in a time that they really didn't know what fungi were and they thought that they were plants, but then they were heterotrophs, but they had pigments. So because they had pigments, they thought that they were more closely related to like algae and plants. So here we have some really cool phycomyces. If you do look at this one, maybe just clip some stuff off the top as opposed to taking the whole poop home. Um, something else cool, if you get deer poop and you put it into a glass container, um, I, I guess I'd recommend having a lid on it and then mist it with a little bit of water or just keep it kind of humid in there and warm and somewhere where it has sunlight. They need light and dark cycles, but the fungi within that poop are often zygomycetes and they will make fruiting bodies that you can um, then look at. So incubate yourself some deer poop and see some cool stuff grow out of it. So 
this group is united by the production of this crazy spore. Um, so it's a zygosporangium, which forms zygospores inside. It's a thick wall, highly ornamented. It's often pigmented. Um, sometimes these ornaments are like crazy spikes, but it's huge. And there are many haploid nuclei inside, one from each mating strain. So two compatible mating types, we call them plus and minus, sense each other chemically. And that induces the formation of these hypofilaments that will grow out toward each other. These are going to be the gametangia, the spot where gametes are made. So those gametangia touch, and then they form walls. These are the only walls within the whole mycelium. And then they have a bunch of nuclei in those two walled off compartments, some plus nuclei and some minus nuclei. And then they dissolve the wall between them, and those fuse together to make a bunch of different diploid nuclei. And around that structure then grows this thick ornamented wall. So that's the zygosporangium full of zygospores. Those zygospores can then undergo meiosis to become haploid, and another sporangium will grow out of this to disperse those haploid spores. So pretty complex, weird life cycle. It's in your textbook um, under the zygospore forming fungi. But this is what it looks like. So if you can find one of these and see it under your microscope, it'd be really cool. This is that life cycle. In botany, we will look at a lot of life cycles. This is something you'll get used to drawing um, and knowing all of the stages of. Usually we cover these more in lab, um, but I tend to draw through them in lecture. So for all the organismal groups, one of those characteristics that we'll look at are their life cycle. Fungi have this weird life cycle. It's called a haplontic life cycle because they spend most of the time, their multicellular phase, as haploid. All their nuclei only have one set of chromosomes. So here is where they lose that haploid condition. They become dikaryotic. So plasmogamy means that the cytoplasm has joined together, but the nuclei haven't fused yet. They're just bouncing around and there's haploid nuclei. And so that is this weird thing that all fungal groups do. And as fungi evolve, they have a longer and longer phase where there's multiple types of nuclei floating around unfused. That is called being dikaryotic. Di for two, karyo for the nucleus, like a eukaryote has a true nucleus. So we're dikaryotic here within the zygosporangium, and then karyogamy happens. Karyo for the nuclei, and gamy actually means marriage. So the nuclei get married and form diploid nuclei. But in fungi, they only have a very short diploid phase. As soon as two nuclei fuse together, they might rest in that condition as that single diploid spore, but they will then divide. So zygotes, that first diploid cell, will never grow in fungi. They will only divide by meiosis to become haploid again. So you'll see that in this fungal life cycle for all of the groups, but we'll get this extension of the dikaryotic phase. This is weird um, and really unites kingdom fungi. So watch out for that and this sort of trend of the extended dikaryotic phase. Okay, we'll stop here before we get to the glomerulomycota.